Monitor by Sam Tarrado. The baby monitor squeals and my hand jerks to find it, pulling me out of a dreamless, unsteady sleep. Before I know where I am or what's going on, I've clutched the receiver to my head and I'm zeroed in on the sound of the noise. May, my baby daughter, is crying in the dark. The sound rings in my head and down my spine. It cramps my stomach and my veins clench. She's calling out because she's scared or hurting. Something's wrong. And her daddy has to be there for her. Her room is opposite the master bedroom and it's not more than eight steps from the bed to me. So go straight for her and pick her up before you turn the lights on. In the dark, my mind is a pinball machine having a seizure, rattling and pleading. What's wrong? Again and again. I'm a good daddy, so it's my job, my duty, to make sure she's properly cared for. There, the first hints of pink light start to brighten the room. I picked out that lamp specially for her. It comes on a kind of rosy at first, then slowly gets brighter and whiter, so it's less harsh on my maid's eyes. Now I can make out shapes. The crib. The songbirds of North Africa mobile. The baby monitor and that stupid clown mural that mommy insisted on accepting from her brother. The art school dropout. I hate those damn clowns. And one more time I wonder why they're on May's wall. But she howls again. And the tearing sound from the baby monitor, which I'm still holding onto my ear, shreds the thoughts about murals and clowns and that brother-in-law. I turn the volume low and set it down. Right, check her diaper. My daughter shouldn't be spending the night wet, but it's nothing. Of course she doesn't need a change now. She usually doesn't need one until her 5 a.m. feed. So what is it? Hunger? Yeah, try giving her the bottle. No. She's not hungry, not at all. Look at how she's struggling. She's still working on the coordination, but my little girl knows how to say no. She'll turn her head back and away, then put up her hands and start fighting. Just look at her. Turn the head and then swing. No, don't want it. So what then? Is she too hot? May shouldn't be dressed in those thick pyjamas at that time of year. But mummy knows best, doesn't she? Mummy decided to bundle you up in those cotton flannel pyjamas, just in case. See what mummy knows now. My poor May could be just roasting like that. So check her temperature, forehead to forehead. Waiting and watching like this, sometimes I want to scream too. Why can't I make this thing right? Any idiot with testicles can become a dad, so what's wrong with me that I can't take care of my daughter? Sure, she's my little miracle. There can't be that much wrong with her. Then she screams again. And that sick, guilty feeling pulls out the bottom of my stomach one more time. Figure out what's wrong. Nothing else matters. So I lower the binoculars, roll down the driver's side window, and refocus on her bedroom from across the street. There. And mummy's holding you and feeling your forehead again. This time with the inside of her wrist, but it's not a fever, is it, May? Ah, she's kicking. It's too strong for a fever. 
even while I'm feeling caught out with the sound of her crying. I see the way she kicks and I want to smile. She pulls up her left leg, then the right, before snapping them out in a quick one too. She caught me in the face with that more than once, back when I was looking after her. I remember feeling her do that exact same kick before she was even born, thumping my hands from inside mummy's stomach. All that time, I was wondering, what was she doing in there? How was she sitting? What was she feeling? Was she comfortable curled up in that stomach, in the dark? Did she know her daddy was right there? watching over her. Then <coughs> mummy turns away and I can see the hall light come on, shining through the window of my old workroom, the spare room. The stairway lights come on next, reflected in the front door glass, then finally the light in the kitchen. I focus again and see my poor maze all red, blotchy. Crying. Mummy keeps walking back and forth between the fridge and the table, cooing and trying to figure out what to do next. Her face is all pooched up and she's saying, Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no. And jostling May around. As if that would actually help. I told her, and I told her that what May likes best is to have her head against the centre of your chest while you go and make your voice lower each time the sound changes. She likes the buzzing and vibration rumbling from your body to hers. But mummy always says oolululu and bounces her around because mummy always says oolululu and bounced her. Mummy always knows best and mummy's mummy always knew best. They got all the answers, don't they? Except May is still crying, so someone must still be doing something wrong. She's trying to burp her now. Stupid. It's been almost ten minutes since she woke up, and she's still crying. May never cries for this long when I've got her. And this isn't fussing! It's full bore, wide open crying. I can see her screaming inside, and I can feel it out of here. Across the street. She's crying! And I still don't know what's wrong in there. I tell myself there's no cause for panic. I'm not one of those parents who runs off to the doctor for every little thing. Besides, a parent's got to cope. You've got to be the first and the last resort. Right now, she's crying because something's not right. Figure out what it is and take care of it! It's not hunger. It's not gas. So to check her over again. And just as I'm thinking it, Mummy lays May down on the kitchen table and checks again to find... Nothing. What's wrong? She's hurting. And this whole thing is cutting me up inside. For the hundredth time tonight, I want to break down the door, grab my daughter and take her somewhere else. Somewhere clean and quiet and warm and safe. I want to curl my arms around my merry May Day and fix whatever it is that's wrong. I want to take her away and keep her safe. 
that's what a father's supposed to do, a good father. Protect his baby. Then I realise I've let go of the steering wheel and I'm about to open the car door. The inside lights of the car are always switched off, but opening the door here would probably activate the security lights next door. And even though I'm outside of the judge's fucking 50 metre limit, Mummy knows she can just call the cops and Daddy gets a trip down to the fucking police station anyway. Daddy's not a bad man, and if he goes to jail, he can't help May. He can't even see May. So I take a deep breath, brush the empty cups and wrappers off the dashboard, and put the binoculars down. Even though my guts clench every time I hear her muffled crying over the monitor, I close my eyes, put both my hands on the steering wheel, And go over the possibilities again. Not hungry. Not a diaper. Not a fever. Maybe mummy's been mixing the formula wrong and, it, and it's gas. Maybe it's a spider bite. Or, or she got one of her fingers trapped in something. Could be anything. Anything. And then when I'm trying to block out the vision of me bursting into the house and grabbing me, I hear it. Quiet. Quiet. I open my eyes and grab the binoculars to see into the kitchen window again. I can see Mummy walking back and forth in front of the sink and juggling something in front of May's face. I refocus and look again. <laughs> it's that yellow dish scrubber. What, you know, one of the shit ones with the, the hollow handles that mummy insists on buying. But those stupid bristles are curled back like some kind of worn out flower and it's caught May's eyes. She's waving it at her and her face is relaxing. The dark blotches and her cheeks are starting to fade. Whatever it was, it's okay. It's over. I start to relax and as the sick, hollow feeling pauses, I realise I'm hungry. One hand still holding the binoculars, I grope around the car with the other, searching for something to eat. The paper sack from McDonald's is empty. The cup in the cup holder is empty too. Even that waxy tasting water from the melted ice is gone. I toss them all into the footwell with the other trash. There's not even a gum or mints or anything in the glove box, so I push the feeling aside and watch my girl happy again. Mummy is circling the scrubber above May's face, swooping it in close, then fluttering it away, and May is tracking it with her eyes, smiling that pink gums smile, and trying to reach it. She's missing it. But with each swing, she gets a little bit closer to getting the timing right. And I'm thinking that my Mary May will get it in a few weeks or so. Just watch. And then mummy turns away from the window and I can't see anymore. She leans on the way out and the kitchen goes dark. A few moments later, the light from the stairwell goes out. Followed by the one in the upstairs hallway. And the empty room next to maze goes dark. I turn up the sound on the baby monitor and press it to my ear. I can hear mummy humming and muttering something in the sound of cloth. Maybe blankets moving before nothing. 
All I'm getting is the sound of blush rushing in my ears because I've been holding my breath. And slowly, slowly, the light in May's room turns pink and fades. That soft pink colour gets dimmer and dimmer, just like it's supposed to. But I've been staring through the binoculars so hard, I'm seeing those flickers you get from looking at the same thing for too long. From out here, I can't tell when that warm light over my baby has finally, completely, gone out.